The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. campus of Mercy College is delighted to host this roundtable discussion on education and what makes a great teacher. It is an absolute pleasure to heartily welcome all the students, the teachers, Secretary Cardona, Congressman Bowman, Chancellor Porter, and Commissioner Rosa. Mercy College has 10,000 students. 55% of them are Pell eligible. Decades ago, a low-income student could get a Pell Grant and it would cover 80% of their college tuition. Today, same grant covers 30%. Teachers can't teach if students don't go to school. The Family Cares Act removes barriers by providing childcare and enhancing Pell. With that, I look forward to a hearty discussion and want to turn it over to Secretary Cardona. Thank you very much. So glad to be here. You know, I have family members who are big fans of the New York Giants, right? And um, I'm looking around this room. These are the New York Giants right here. Uh, thank you for, for uh, welcoming me and, and for giving me the opportunity to listen. Uh, we just wrapped up a, a Help Us Here tour where we visited like nine states or ten states and just, just listen. And um, that's going to help influence the work that we do. I can go on about the American Families Plan and how it's going to provide unprecedented unprecedented support to really reimagine where we can go in education in our country. But instead today, I really want to hear what your experiences have been um, as students, as educators, uh, trying to go through the pandemic, because that's going to frame the work that we do moving forward. Um, we know that the investment with the American Family Plan will get us moving in the right direction. And I look forward to uh, listening to make sure that the urgency that the president has and that I share and that Congressman Bowman has around building back better mm -hmm. turns into real strategies influenced by the experiences that you've had and what you would want to see. So uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Uh, I look forward to listening and, and hearing not only your experience, but what you would like to see. What you would like to see when we uh, reopen, reinvest, and reimagine education. That's where we're going. Happy to be here, and uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary Cardona, for including New York City on your listening tour. Thank you so much for coming to the Boogie Down Bronx. Uh, <laughs> there there's, there's, you really, go. there's really no place else I or many of us would, would rather be. Um, Want to shout out uh, old friends and colleagues in the room. Huge shout out to Emily James, Randy Weingarten, Misha Ross Porter, who was my boss before I uh, ran for Congress my uh, as my superintendent. <laughs> 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 And uh, shout to uh, Chancellor Betty, Ch no, Commissioner. Yes. Yes, she was Chancellor before, excuse me. Chancellor and Commissioner uh, Betty Rosa, also my mentor and, and, and Bronx, Bronx nurtured. So this is a very exciting time. Um, in my opinion, this is probably the biggest moment in public education that we've had in, in several decades. Not only uh, do we have the president who is super hyper-focused on our public school system, K-12. He is also focused on early childhood education, which we know is foundational uh, to what happens uh, in our schools. And he's focused on post-secondary opportunities in our community colleges and four-year colleges. So we have a lot of resources coming in uh, through the American Rescue Plan and even more coming in through the American Jobs Plan and the uh, American Families Plan. So this is our moment. This is our moment to reimagine rethink, redesign what happens in our public schools. Uh, but it is not for us to do that alone. Mm -hmm. It is for us to do that in collaboration. And the most important voices in that conversation, in my opinion, are our students. We need to hear from our students. We need to listen to our students. We need to learn from their experiences. 
because their experiences will tell us what we need to do. Uh, so I, I'm just excited to be here with so many students who are going to share their experiences. We are here to listen and uplift them and engage in a very robust conversation and the first of many conversations because God willing we all will be here several decades more to continue to do uh, this great work. Uh, so thank you all so much. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, Congressman. Um, so we thought we'd kick it off with the question, what makes a great teacher? Uh, we thought we'd ask that each uh, participant limit their initial comments to 30 seconds so we can get around the room and then open it up to a discussion. Um, perhaps you could just say who you are and where you attend school or where you teach school. And uh, let's start at the end of the table here with Adika Pimentel. Uh, glad to have you here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Adoka Pimentel. Um, I actually am no longer in school, uh, but um, I'm, a, I'm an organizer that organizes with young people in New York City. And so um, I'm really here to play a support role uh, for the young person at the end over there. Um, so I would rather allocate that time for the young people and come back for something else. Thank you. Thank you. Crystal. Yeah, same thing. Crystal from uh, Sister and Brothers United and here in the Bronx, and I will pass my turn to Brian, who is a young person a student. Hello, my name is Brian. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, with Sisters and Brothers United and the Urban Youth Collaborative. And I'm a recent graduate of a high school. Um, yeah, and I attend Kingsburg Community College right now. My name is Niana Garcia. I'm a senior at Bronx Leadership Academy in the Bronx. I am representing the Healing Center Schools Working Group. And that's enough. My name is Jeanette Orellana. I am a senior at Information Technology High School, and I am representing, representing um, Girls for Gender Equity, and I'm a former member of NICLU's Teen Activist Project. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Betty Rosa, and currently the commissioner and museum president. And um, I'm delighted to be here to discuss such an amazing topic. <laughs> um, I often think about the fact that as, uh, as a teacher and having gone through uh, the process, once a teacher, always a teacher. And so for me, we never stop being a teacher. I think all of us collectively in this room will always speak uh, with what I call the teacher voice mm -hmm. and teachable moments. And so I think uh, teachers are amazing individuals. They're always the ones that when we close our eyes, we often think about uh, who influenced you because they have that direct contact. They, they create what I call the human connection uh, with students. And so I look at a teacher who has a sense of empathy, who has a sense of academic uh, connection and knows his or her content area has the IQ in terms of the area of social, emotional, culture, and language. And most importantly, uh, sets the pathway and creates a roadmap for our young people to follow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is there a way that we could uh, ask, answer the question? Yes. I kind of like to ask myself. Actually, I think that would be wonderful. Um, I guess since I spoke, I'll go. Um, I think for me, what makes a good teacher is one that can relate to a student, specifically not only in academics, not only from personal experience, but also from cultural experience and even from culture. Um, in my school, I've seen quite a few people who are teachers who were of color, others who weren't, um, but nonetheless, I would have uh, rather seen a lot more teachers who didn't come from other states. Um, in order to teach my school. Um, I will also say that I think regardless of, um, well, no, I would say that I would like a knowledgeable teacher. Um, he, her, they, regardless, um, just so long as they're, they're cool, they connect with the student, and the student feels comfortable with them um, at the same time. Yeah. To add on to that, um, to me, a great teacher is someone who listens, 
and was responsive and someone who cares because a lot of times kids don't have that at home. So it's really beneficial when they are in school and during the few hours, even if it's just a few, seven hours or so, there's someone that they know they can go to and that they can confine in and feel safe and comfortable with. So to me, a great teacher is empathetic, trustworthy, honest, and supportive. Uh, our teachers are molding mm -hmm. the minds of our youth, so having these traits are extremely important to me. Can you say the last part of what you said, please? Uh, teachers are molding the minds of our youth, so having these traits are extremely important. Can, you, can I jump over to Kaliata? Because uh, Kaliata is also here as a student. and. Uh, Please just introduce us yourself, tell us where you're from, and uh, please answer the question, what makes a great teacher? Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Kanyata. I'm Arshihar. I am from Kanyata. I'm 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 from Kanyata. I'
Um, and if you see me on a Zoom in my office, you'll see that poster in the back of me every time I'm in a Zoom in my office. And it says, teachers inspire, encourage, empower, nurture, activate, motivate, and change the world. But we need the time, tools, and trust to do that. And we need people who are going to help us do that as opposed to what's going on right now, which is the uh, push against teaching accurate history and the push against teaching racial literacy. And so we're in the midst of um, needing to do so much for our kids, as the secretary said, to recover, reimagine, and yet at the same exact time, there is in several different states this push against us in terms of the teaching of accurate history, including things like 1619 and the Tulsa massacre, and the push against the teaching of things that are uncomfortable. And teaching racism is uncomfortable, and teaching and being anti-racist is makes people uncomfortable, and this is part and parcel of, of what teachers are now facing. Good morning, everybody. My name is Yongda Miller. I'm from Mercy College um, and the School of Education, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of uh, Literacy Multilingual Studies. We have TESA bilingual and literacy graduate programs for teachers. So since my field is in TESA, for those who don't know what TESA is, it's teaching English to speakers of other languages. So our teachers are working with English language learners so for me, um, a great teacher, a good educator, is the teachers and educators who, who um, value in the students' home languages and cultures. And more importantly, to use their you know, home language and culture and their background knowledge as resources. I think we're always looking for resources somewhere else. Our students and families bring resources to the school. So using the, that as resources to help English-based learners and their families. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer Tulipano. I am teacher and chairperson of the science department at Monsignor Scanlon High School. I'm a dual Mercy alum. I graduated with my undergrad in psychology and my graduate in school counseling. I am back in the classroom. Um, what I've been taught here by the professors is that I am a lifelong learner, and when I am in the classroom teaching my students, I'm pulling from a vat of knowledge and resources, personal resources, that allow me to rise above challenges that we face in education and to make the best with what we have access to. Um, I believe that a good educator has to be invested in the work of education because it is extremely, an extremely challenging profession uh, that is constantly changing and evolving, and so we need to be able to do so with it. Um, it's a great responsibility that has been invested to us, and again, um, I, I find that my fundamental values are, are they run deep, and they allow me to deliver my lessons to reach each and every student and their needs, whatever they might be. Good morning, I'm Misha Porter. I'm New York City Schools Chancellor, also a Mercy alum, a College alum, um, also a Bronx resident, so it's good to be home and good to be amongst friends. When I thought about this question, I listened to young people and I thought about it from, from my perspective as a former student and, and what a great teacher meant to me. And it was all of the things you said, but it was really about you know, seeing the possibilities in me that I couldn't see in myself and lifting it out. And I also come from a family of teachers, and so it is work that is in the blood. But I remember as a student, you know, when, when I was doing well and when I was having challenges that I had great teachers who saw me and lifted me up and encouraged me um, and pushed me forward. And then when I heard Ali and Randy talk, I thought about a great teacher from the perspective of my, as, it, from my perspective as an administrator and supervisor and, and what that means. And that's really about what this moment is about. It's about creating the conditions, the supports, the tools, the materials, the resources, the learning, the cover for great teaching to happen. And so, you know, I'm looking forward to leaning in as, as the mother of a New York City public school student to supporting that so all of our, our students have that from all of the teachers across our city. 
is, yeah, it, is it possible? I'm sorry to add. I know I skipped my turn, but <laughs> I kind of feel a little inspired. Uh, so again, my name is Adilka. I use she and they pronouns. Um, I went to New York City public schools all my life. I immigrated here from the Dominican Republic, but grew up here, uh, which meant that I was in high school undocumented, right? Um, also, uh, like a rape survivor, you know? And so some things that really allowed me to flourish in schools were teachers who saw me and understood if I acted out or if I had an issue. Um, they didn't rely on calling the police. They didn't rely on school safety agents. They didn't rely on punitive measures that so many teachers, um, I think, are really conditioned, right, to do versus, like, wanting to do. And so for me, what saved me in high school, and really, we know that the more police around you, the higher the interactions. And I went to a school that had more police than guidance counselors, for sure. And so for me, it was that safety and them understanding my trauma and understanding me as a person versus, like, leaning toward these measures that were really, really unforgiving and really, really um, inhumane for young people in school. And so my safe space was within those relationships that I built with those teachers. Um, and so I feel like when I think about what makes a great teacher, it's understanding the humanity of a person um, rather than you know relying on things that uh, not only statistically don't work, but young people you know have been calling for a removal of for decades. And so really grateful for those teachers who saw me for me mm -hmm. um, as this like rambunctious, angry kid who really just had a lot going on. You know, so super grateful for that. I'm good, man. We can skip me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm going to hold my comment. Believe me, man. I can talk, but the time is short. I, I came here to listen. and yeah. I have comments at the end, but powerful. I loved it. I loved it. I loved the comments. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Secretary. So Secretary Cardona's team generated a few questions um, to throw out to the group. I, I think it's clear that we're very comfortable with just an open conversation, so if you want to go off script, that's completely, utterly okay. <laughs> I also want to say I'm a father of three school-aged children that also attend public school, and during this past year, witnessed them going from fully online to hybrid to mostly in person, and, you know, I, my kids are in elementary school, so just trying to get a young child to be on a Zoom for seven hours and the teacher maintaining some semblance of sanity it's just been an incredible year so i mean really you all deserve a massive round of applause for what you've done as teachers what you've done as students in this past year so a couple of questions are how do we best support teachers to be the best teachers they can be and how do we motivate young people like people in this room to go into education to become teachers because we need great teachers in the future. So if anyone would like to uh, address either of those or anything else, that would be important. So I can speak to that, I think. Um, it's something I think about all the time. Can you guys hear me? They said something closer to the mic. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think something that I think about all the time. Over 15 years, I've developed so many relationships with my high school kids. And even when they graduated, I, I'm still pretty close with, with a lot of them. And when I chose last year to, to leave, um, the surprising thing to me was when I told them about it. They were sad, but they were also very happy for me. And when I really, really looked hard into that, they told me they thought I deserved better than to be their teacher. And that really broke my heart. So I think that we need to think about how to make teaching in urban schools a sustainable career that our kids are watching, the teachers are not struggling. The teachers are not given 200 students that they have to figure out how to, to manage the paperwork. They're given more support, clerical support even. They're given smaller class sizes. They're given more time. Our students, who would really be the best public school teachers in the future, we want our own students to grow up with this dream to become a teacher. Um, they should see that from the beginning, that teaching is a valued profession. and. My students saw that it wasn't. As much as they loved me, they were happy to see me move on to something else, and that will always stick with me. I don't want that for them. I want teachers, I want kids to look at their teachers and say, wow, this teacher is valued because they are my teacher. They're respected because they are my teacher. And right now, I don't think that we have that. So I, I, I don't know the solution, but that's, that's the deal. Awesome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, as a student, I, I like kind of want to add on to that. Um, I've had a lot of teachers 
that I've come across that I've seen they were struggling. And so to me, it was never a desirable like career path because I seen my teachers that I love so much, but they were all going through so much tough times, you know, having to pay to help our classrooms out of pocket and stuff like that, struggling with, I've seen teachers struggle with rent, bills and stuff and express that to us. Like, I have a lot to do, I'm stressed. And I sometimes it affects the way they're teaching and it, it kind of like, it can interfere with their relationships with their students. And to me, I think giving teachers support, like enough support, actual support, to be able to build great relationships with their students and be able to have a connection with their students is really important. And I don't think we see that. And especially now that things are going on through Zoom, you can see so many teachers are struggling with their own kids and having their own kids in these classes while trying to teach all of us. And I think just giving teachers the support that they need and that they deserve and the respect that they deserve is extremely important. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would add on, like, teachers are part of our school community, which means that our schools need to be healthy and have an ecosystem that actually supports the, the teachers. They often take on a lot of roles um, that don't fall within their training, that fall, don't fall into the time that they're given to work with students. Um, you know, like, they very often because there's no counselors or social workers, they are the people that young people turn to first. If we don't build the systems um, around the teachers that are actually going to support them, right, that means providing health, uh, mental health support for students, right, that means providing schools that have, like, spaces for, for young people to be in and teachers to, to be in to heal, right, like, there's a lot of healing that needs to happen, particularly now in this time, and we need to create those teams, and those teams really are about healing and supporting um, people's mental health and not like pushing them out, not being punitive, not policing students, not policing teachers too, right? Like teachers do get into, into uh, altercations with cops also. And so we want to be very clear that like schools need to be like schools <laughs> and cannot be like feeling like a prison for folks. Great remarks. Just real quick, the data suggests that your points are really excellent, meaning today if a teacher is not in a two-income family, meaning, let's say you're talking about a single dad, a single mom who's a teacher, that the ability to pay your rent, address your own mental health, et cetera, is exceedingly difficult. So uh, part of what I hear you saying is financial support and then sort of the ecosystem things that need to be improved in schools. Excellent points. Mm -hmm. um, can I speak to that? Please. Um, I often say that teaching is one of the most overworked and underpaid professions, and I am not in this for money. Mm -hmm. um, I am in this because I do believe that you have to be the change that you want to see in the world, and I do try to instill that in all of my students. And I think what I found most during this pandemic was a lack of access to the technology that we needed to be equipped to be educated in a digital world. I am part of the Amazon Future Engineer program at my school, so we are giving the students computer science, yet there's not enough access to, uh, let's say, laptops that they could take home with them. And so that was the, the biggest challenge that I faced as an educator during this pandemic, and I can speak both as a, a teacher and a parent, was access to those iPads, those Chromebooks. Um, my, my three children are in the New York City public school system, and I was told there were no devices left for them by the time I'm at Tulipano. So I'm assuming they went alphabetically, and by the time they got to me, there were no devices left. And so in order to ensure that they were able to be educated, I had to go in pocket and buy them all those three devices. And I was happy to do that, but mm -hmm. I do feel that if we're going to push in this direction, we need to equip both our students and our teachers for education moving forward. Something I want to say, I definitely agree with what you're saying. Um, I do believe that teachers need to be equipped this time because no one was equipped for this pandemic. No one really thought that this was going to get out of hand. No one thought that, you know, this is going to get out of hand. And it wasn't until, like, I was one of the fortunate ones to have uh, a last name, a who, which is an A. So I was one of the fortunate ones to receive a laptop, an iPad. Um, unlike my brother who had to wait a whole month and so we had to share um, and it was kind of difficult um, to try to maintain both of our classes and my teachers understood 
but there aren't many teachers like my teachers who are more lenient in letting me maybe skip class as long as I did the worksheet. Um, for example, my brother's teachers, they were not at all exceptional. They were like, you have to be a part of this if you need to learn this, and I understood. And so when it comes to the resources, I definitely feel like this time around, we need to invest in the students, we need to invest in the teachers, because much like Crystal mentioned, much like you mentioned, there's not going to be enough resources when we go back into the schools. If we go back into the schools, I'm pretty sure we are, um, during the fall. And there's still not going to be enough counselors for mental health support, like Crystal had mentioned. There's not going to be enough social workers to support the students. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> and alongside that, I, I definitely agree that we need more counselors in our schools. We need more social workers. That has got to be one of the things that we need and is most vital simply because I'm going to give a quick synopsis of my pandemic um, or how I spent my pandemic. Um, not only did we have to quarantine, not only did we have to wear masks and get vaccinated and all that, but my grandmother died of COVID-19. And I had to deal with that while continuing my education. So did my brother and my mother. Um, and although this is not related to COVID-19, my ex um, shot himself, suicide, because he couldn't deal with the financial struggle that COVID-19 had brought. And this is just something that I had to deal with during my time as a student. Now, this is, a, I think it, my, my story is a perfect example of things that you don't know will happen and you won't think it's gonna happen to you, but it eventually does. And you have to deal with that along with continuing to be a student, continuing to be a support system if you have a single mother who has no job, who is under um, financial, not financially, like aid from the government, um, and it's just, this is, when we, when we talk about support, this is what I mean. This is what students need. Students need to go back into schools knowing that they're going to feel like they're going to be welcome, like they're not going to be treated any different, that they feel that they can open up to someone if they feel like, you know, for, for example, if I went to school and I feel like I was having an episode of me thinking about my dead grandmother, I would like to, I would like to, you know, talk to someone just really quickly and then, um, and alongside that, teachers also should be trained so that if there's no, for example, counselors available, they, get, they are equipped with the training to analyze the situation and not in a sense deal with it, but you know, with using their trainings, uh, things that they learn from the trainings, analyze the situation and, to, and you know, help the student. Um, so yeah. Uh, what I hear you saying is like being trauma responsive, mm -hmm. which I agree with. Um, I'm the oldest of five, and I struggled a lot during this pandemic. I was homeless at one point, and a lot of my my siblings sometimes their laptops wouldn't work, and we had to use our phones and stuff like that. And it's just a struggle. And I'm so thankful to have teachers who I'm lucky to have teachers who were trauma responsive and understood that I was going through a really really tough time like having a single mother and being in a shelter and having to go through that whole process was something that's so traumatizing and I've dealt with it for so long but my teachers understand me and they've always like tried to help me get through it and not pressured me to like not been strict like you have to do this at this time and yeah. just being understanding and flexible is so important flexibility and understanding that every student is going through something different and you have to be responsive to that you have to understand that I think that's the most important thing mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. at the beginning of the pandemic it seemed very difficult but I was able to get through it. I had my iPad and I had my phone to work on for schoolwork. But due to the pandemic, my family struggled with money and we couldn't pay for Wi-Fi. So the only thing I had left was to use the data on my phone. And I was doing projects, I was doing essays, I was doing my um, activism work on the side all through my phone. And my phone is the iPhone 8. It's not the latest model. It's slow sometimes, it gets annoying, it freezes. And it's been a struggle, but I've had teachers who are extremely understanding and supportive and they know that maybe if I miss a couple assignments, it's fine because I could get back on track. I could do them in a couple hours and I'll be fine. But because I have struggled, I can also understand that my teachers are also struggling. So 
to have these teachers struggling with no support, it's very, I don't know how to say it, like, I just feel very bad for them because these teachers are always there for us, but who is there for them? Mm. Who are they going to? They are overworked, underpaid. Some of them have to pay out of pocket for supplies for their students. Some of them have to make accommodations for certain students. And they have no resources. That doesn't make... We need more resources for our teachers. Because, like students, they also have struggles with mental health issues, family issues. We don't actually go to our teachers and we ask them how they're doing. It's usually a one-side conversation and we need to be there for our teachers. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I wanted to pull you in if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, um, what I'm hearing is that, you know, there's a lot of need in our schools for our students and teachers, but we invest so much money in police cops in their schools. Um, so just, we, you know, young people need to co go back to schools where um, approaches are from change from like criminalization to care and support. So just redirecting where we're putting our resources um, that will create a safe and supportive environment for young people. So that's just my thoughts. Yeah, thank you. And to add on to that, um, I do believe that we need a supportive administration system. You know, because like you know, Jan Jeanette? Yeah. Jeanette, okay. Just like Jeanette said, you know, sometimes we are, you know, I'm a teacher in the 3K program, you know, so I know I've seen it as a student and in a teacher perspective, and we're listening to the students, you know. I have three-year-olds in my classroom, and I see that they are struggling. I see it on Zoom with my Zoom students, and I see it with my in-person students. But you have to have, as a teacher, you have to have the support from your administration system. It's not just you know, a one-way street where you're listening to the students because you want to help your students, but how can a teacher help their students if the teacher's not getting the support from their administration system? They're not listening. You know, you want to voice your opinion. You're always telling students to voice their opinions, talk about what's happening, but you can't do that if your administration system's not listening to you, you know? So I really appreciate you guys being here today because this is where you make a start. You know, you're listening to everybody. You guys are not, you know, you're just open ears. You know, so I really do appreciate that, and that's where it's going to start. So we have about five minutes before we get to final remarks. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, I just wanted to, to insert, or just make an observation, then, then ask a general question. So I, I'm hearing a lot about uh, empathy as a real foundation of the entire system. First, empathy for our students, then empathy for our teachers, then empathy for our administration, and a system of empathy. Uh, that's really trauma-informed and trauma-responsive, and the need to infuse uh, emotional intelligence into our schools, um, social and emotional learning, social and emotional intelligence. Uh, what we often hear from people who don't have these touchy-feely conversations that we're having right now is, oh, we need to have high expectations for kids. Oh, we need to we, we need to have great outcomes for kids. You know, we need to make sure they, you know, have great test scores and, and graduate with honors and go to the best colleges. And that's what we need to do with our kids to make sure they're ready for the world beyond that. Um, how would you as students respond to, to, to that way of, of, of thinking? Um, in contrast to what we're talking about here? Um, I think it's tougher. I've experienced that before. I went to a IB middle school in the Bronx called Mott Hall Science and Technology Academy, and I love that school so much. And I was lucky enough that even though there were some teachers who were really like, you have to go to the best colleges, you have to like graduate with really high test scores, there was other teachers that understood that sometimes students are giving as much as they could and that you have to work with that and I think I'm so appreciative of teachers that are more lenient and more understanding and trauma responsive and culturally responsive and understand that we all are having different experiences rather than the teachers who are really like it comes off like aggressive like to like this passion for students I understand the passion for students for wanting your students to do well but you also have to understand that everyone is different and every student has a different story 
and you can't just push the same agenda on every student because it's never going to work that way. Um, I think an example for me, um, I was a student who used to get, well, not was, am, um, even in college, really high scores. Not to brag, not to brag. Um, so you can. But um, I, I definitely was a really, really like, like an A student type thing. Um, however, I never really participated in National Honor Society because I felt like that excluded students and me, like for me personally, before I got to like, you know, straight A's and stuff, I used to be the student who was like, damn, I wish I was there one day. Um, and it kind of not encouraged me, but made me feel bad about myself, making me feel like I'm lesser than, simply because my scores weren't high. Um, but to continue what I was saying, um, even though I had good scores, specifically in English and in science, people expected that I would probably work for like NASA or do some type of like science-y type thingy or even like become a journalist. But I chose to pursue culinary as that's my passion, that's always been my passion. And neither of those really touch on that topic, not as much. And so um, I would probably be like, you know, well, I would probably show that Simply because a student is good at something does not mean that that's what they want to do. That's what they want to be. They could end, they could end up just being an owner of a restaurant, and you would think them lesser of. But in reality, they just that's what they wanted to do. That's what they wanted to pursue, and that's something that I like to like share among like people. Because even like with my friends, when I used to have friends in high school, um, they used to be like, oh, like you know, you're like the the teacher's pet. The teacher likes you. The teacher's always giving you good grades. And I felt bad because it felt like my duty was to tutor them and to, you know, help them. And it, they felt lesser than simply because I was their friend and I was the smartest. And, well, sorry, I was the one with the best grades. And it just, I, I feel like it's kind of, in a sense, bold because um, even, like, standardized testing doesn't test a student's, like, intelligence. Like, a student can probably fail math and, and English and still be really smart, but just because it's standardized testing, we don't really know how a student is and how smart they are. So, yeah. And also, not, to, not that it's anybody's business, but I also, um, I'm a student who went to school with ADHD, and some people even think that ADHD is like bad, and I even had a friend who um, graduated um, with way better scores than me, and he also had ADHD, and it was kind of like, you know, it's not a matter of like, what student is smarter it's about it's you know they choose they students will choose what they want regardless of which and he decided to choose um to be like a doctor and i decided to choose culinary and we both were like almost not that close but almost match to match with grades so i think it's just really important to note that no student is lesser than regardless of their grades thank you so amazing points excellent discussion i really want to thank everyone I'm going to turn it over to Secretary Cardona and Congressman Bowman to wrap things up. Thank you. Go first. Yeah, I just want to uh, thank everyone for being here. This was an amazing conversation. Again, the beginning of many conversations. This, this just can't be a one-off. Uh, and I want to encourage my colleagues, and many of you already know, we, we listen to students all the time, so we're going we're gonna to continue to do that. Um, and we're going to do everything we can in Congress. I'm on the Education and Labor Committee. I'm Vice Chair of the Education and Labor Committee. We're going to do everything we can to uh, introduce and implement policy uh, that aligns to everything uh, we heard today. So, so, so thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you, students, for your voices and your ideas. Uh, and I hope we can build a school system rooted in those ideas. So, so thank you so much. Thank you. You know, the president talks about restoring the soul of a nation. Mm -hmm. These conversations, these opportunities to listen really are uh, like fuel for my soul as an educator. So thank you. Thank you for being vulnerable for a little bit, for sharing. We need to hear from teachers, from uh, students, uh, the important work we have ahead of us. Um, I'm inspired. I'm inspired. I wrote down a few things. Relationships, right? Relationships, this is a people business. Whether it's relationships with our students, with our educators, with our leaders, this is about relationships. And the pandemic has proven that. 
It's about relationships. It's about connecting with the people you serve, right? And if we do that well, if we do that well, they're going to grow. If we do that well with our educators, they're going to grow. They're going to want to be there. Um, I wrote down the three R's. You know, we talk about reading, writing, arithmetic. No. Reopening, reinvesting in our schools, and reimagining the potential. Reimagining the potential. But I wrote down, are we structured to listen? These are great events. When we reopen schools, are we structured to listen? Are we structured to care? Are we, when we're thinking about reopening, are we redesigning our schools differently? Or are we going to go back to the same old business that led to some of the feelings that were expressed today? Are we structured to care? Are we structured to be trauma-informed? Or are we going to go back to business as usual, and when that kid has their head down or uh, is upset, are we going to discipline that, or are we going to treat it as a symptom of trauma? Thank you, Brian, for sharing your story. There's a professional learning that we're going to provide our teachers about what was lost academically, or are we going to realize that what we need to do is really talk about the social, social and emotional well-being, not only of our learners, but of our educators, of our entire school community. How are we utilizing the precious time of our educators when they come back? Are we structured to care? Are we going to be student-centered? Or are we going to have little random acts of student voice sprinkled around to keep everyone happy? Are we structured to listen? I'm going to tell you as a father, I went through this pandemic too. I have a 15-year-old and a 16-year-old. And not only during the pandemic, but throughout their education career, when, when my kids came home, how was school today? What I was saying is, did you feel cared for? Did you feel like you belonged there? Were you seen today? Did you hear your name called today? Yes, every once in a while I'll ask about the reading lesson or the math lesson, but is, are you a part of a school community that's welcoming to you? And that's what I heard today. You know, I could go on in detail about how the American Family Plan request $2.8 billion for Grow Your Own programs so we can see teachers that look like the beautiful diversity in front of us. I could talk about the $2 billion that are going to go to support teachers, which we heard today, and leaders, which we heard today, to make sure that they have the tools that they need, that they have mentorship so they don't leave the profession. I could talk to you about $1.6 billion to uh, fill bilingual education classrooms, special education, those hard-to-reach certification areas or that the American Rescue Plan has $130 billion to make sure our schools are redesigning and putting social and emotional well-being and mental health access at the center of the conversation. But instead, what I want to say is all that money, all that money won't amount to what the president had planned unless we all act with urgency now and in the fall. Don't let the change of mask wearing and distancing let us forget the level of urgency that we feel right now where students who have experienced so much loss families, teachers experience so much loss, we need to rebuild better we need to make sure every single penny that was used for this goes to where it's supposed to go Liana, so you know your family members have experienced Jeanette, so you know that and I appreciate your empathy when you're talking about your iPhone 8. That's what I wrote down. You have an iPhone 8 and you're dealing with that, and that's, but you're worried about the teacher's emotional health. You're showing empathy. You're like, so let's not lose a sense of urgency. We're, this is a moment in our country, and we're in it, whether we like it or not. And we're all leaders. We're all leaders. Regardless of letters after your name, your age, what titles you have, we're all leaders in this. And we're in this together. So, to close, I'm going to quote a Bronx rapper, since we had an interlude here, and it made me think. Careful, careful. Listen, Slick Rick, okay? All right. Start. Start. 
Well, he said a song, he, he wrote a song in 99, last millennium, last, so I'm aging myself too, last uh, century, uh, I run this. Well, I'm going to change that to we run this. Yes. We run this. And if we're serious about building back better, we need everyone at the table. That's right. We need us fighting now. I love the activism, activism here. I love it. There's nothing in this country that ever was worth fighting for that students didn't lead. That's right. That's right. Yep. So please, this is our moment. We run this. Yes. We will build back better. And we will have an education system that we're proud of if we lock arms about the things that we value most. And in this room, there was tremendous overlap. Let's continue to fight together to make um, our education system we're all proud of. Um, we can do this, and we're going to do it together. Thank you so much for the visit. Thank you for your words you. and your contributions to the field. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> so I want to thank Chan Commissioner Rosa, Chancellor Porter, Congressman Bow Bowman, and Secretary Cardona. And I want to especially thank all of you for sharing your stories. Have a wonderful day. Go Mercy Bronx. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Slick Rick is the same choice. Slick Rick is the same choice.